I'm very pleased to be sharing the stage with uh, Dr. Tim Flannery, who, um, and it's my uh, job, my responsibility to introduce him, but, uh, and I could give you a, a very long list of his accomplishments and awards, but to me, the significant thing about Tim Flannery is this, and I actually don't even know if he'd agree with what I'm going to say, but he's a mammologist and a paleontologist and has already had a distinguished career in that area, having discovered many new species and was able to read the history or the prehistory of Australia with the coming of people and the killing off of the large marsupials. And frankly, I don't think anyone would disagree that Tim Flannery could have continued to be a mammologist and a paleontologist. It's an exciting uh, kind of work. It involves discovery. But instead, he's become an environmentalist at probably one of the most difficult and challenging times to be an environmentalist. And it reminds me a little bit of Jane Goodall, who would like nothing better than to spend 52 weeks a year in Gombe, and spends instead two weeks a year in Gombe, 50 weeks on the road, raising money to protect chimpanzees. That's a kind of selflessness that I think is unusual. And uh, for my money, Tim Flannery has taken that same route and writes important books, like the one we're going to discuss tonight, that hopefully will awaken uh, the global population, or at least those of us who are most responsible for the problems that face us, to do something about it to leave a career that you love and take on another one because you think it's more important, I think is a, is a very courageous and honorable act. And that's the man who will be addressing us all tonight. Now this book, Now or Never, Why We Need to Act Now to Achieve a Sustainable Future, is a very important book in my mind because it, it offers a fresh perspective on some of the things that we've heard a lot about, but it offers it in a way that it enables you to focus your thoughts about those important things. And uh, I'm quite sure that Tim will be able to convince you that it's uh, an important book and a book worth buying and a book worth reading. And let's begin with that subtitle, if we could. Why we need to act now. So now could be this decade, it could be this half century. What is now? Well, now, for me, Jay, I think, in the context of that book, is the latter half of 2009. Um, because I, I wrote that book as a sort of a, a really a 19th century tract. I don't know whether you've read any of those wonderful arguments that people used to publish as a pamphlet in the 19th century, in 18th century, to, in, in, in favour of abolishing slavery or reform of, of, of labour laws or whatever. And I just felt there was a need at this particular moment in time for an argument or a tract that put the case very clearly uh, for the need for the world to come together to address this climate issue um, at the Copenhagen meeting that will occur um, later this year, which is really the best chance we'll probably ever have of doing so. So that was why, that's what now is about, it's about that period. And of course, the implications go beyond that. There are arguments in the book which will carry beyond that, but the real focus, the diacritical focus, is on that moment in time. What do you hope to see coming out of Copenhagen? At one level, what I hope to see coming out of Copenhagen is a maturing of the human species. It is a, a moment when we realise that we, as human beings, share a common heritage and a common fate and have to actually work together to solve any of the difficult problems we face. So at a broad level, I hope we see the first sparks of that philosophical shift that's going to have to mark this century if we ever want to live sustainably. When it comes down to absolute practicalities for the treaty, however, there's a, a few real prerequisites, and, and one of them is that we all commit to a reduction in the pollution stream that's causing the problem. You know? And the proportion of the reduction that we, um, we commit to will be different for different countries, uh, whether they're developing or developed or, or, or still um, uh, very poorly developed. Uh, we also need a commitment um, to take care of the poorest people on the planet, um, those who are already suffering significant impacts from climate change but who've had none of the benefits of the Industrial Revolution. So we need funding for adaptation, funding for the protection of forests and so forth. We need 
some components of the treaty that deal with technological transfer to make it easy, easier to allow the transfer of technology to the countries that really need it, to developing countries that really need it. And we need a certain transparency and accountability in the rules as well that has to be built in. So there's sort of at least four of the keystones of any, any treaty that's going to mean anything. Um, early in the book, you uh, give some examples of how, if anything, things are more urgent than we even thought a decade ago. Uh, Greenland ice loss, uh, projected temperature, or projected levels of carbon dioxide. Could you just give us a couple of those? Yeah, sure. Well, look, just, just as an aside to this, I, um, I'm staying at the Intercontinental Hotel downtown, and I discovered that the, there's a group of meteorologists, I think the World Meteorological Association, meeting somewhere in Ottawa at the moment. And I got in the elevator up to my room just before this meeting with one of these meteorologists, and he said, you know, the latest data for the ice core stuff shows we've only got 10 years before the ice disappears. <laughs> so that's sort of, <laughs> you know... Um, an unsubstantiated claim, I guess, but we'll see it published sooner or later with some science behind it. But, but one of the key performance indicators that has changed so dramatically over the last five years is the fate of the northern ice cap, the polar ice cap. Um, you know, when I wrote The Weathermakers um, just five years ago, it seemed as if we had a hundred years before we need to worry about this. And that wasn't that long. It was just four or five years ago, you know, and what we've seen since then is a rate of melt of the northern ice cap so fast that somewhere between 10 and maybe 20, maybe 30 years from now, we, we know there won't be an ice cap. So that's just one of the key performance indicators of Earth's climate system that's going in the wrong direction. There's a lot of other ones, that the rate of sea level rise, in fact, I should just run through them for you, because, and for the audience, I think it really is important to understand this, that um, the best way to, to understand how the system is changing is to look at the computer projections that were made about 10 years ago by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and then just ask how accurate those projections are. Now those projections were century-long projections and we can only look at the first decade of the, to calibrate the curve, but when you look at the key performance indicators of Earth's climate system, such as the rate of sea level rise, the rate of CO2 accumulation in the atmosphere, the overall warming rate, you know, for all of those things, the real-world data is it right at the upper bounds or exceeds the upper bounds of the probabilistic assessment, you know, the, the bounds of probability that the IPCC projected just 10 years ago. So what that's telling us is that the IPCC was wrong, in a sense, but they were wrong in being too conservative. The changes are actually happening much faster than anyone would like to think. Which, uh, if I can make an editorial comment, ma makes a mockery of uh, climate change deniers who, who would have said exactly the same first part of that sentence, mm -hmm. the IPC proje IPCC projections are wrong, they would have said, oh, they're way off the scale, it won't be like that at all. And in fact, those, those very projections that were attacked are too conservative. That's right. And the great thing about science is we go back and revisit the data. And that's what science has been doing in this case. They've been saying, okay, we made these projections, let's see whether we were right or wrong. And it is testimony to their objective objectivity that those same scientists have been able to go out and do this and be willing to admit that they were wrong in their initial assumptions.